All right, we're about ready to begin our last session together. Thank you for all your comments uh, after that session. That is no doubt the hardest session that I teach the entire seminar. And uh, you can imagine, I've been to about 100 churches of Christ, and you can imagine some of the looks I get when I teach that session. And uh, I've actually had elders and preachers walk out right during that session. And, um, and brethren, thank you for standing for the truth. The truth is not always easy. And uh, I appreciate, uh, I really do. It means a lot to me that you're here tonight, and uh, very grateful for your, your love for the truth. And um, we are going to begin what uh, I hope is, is the, uh, is the, is the uh, um, catalyst for you to begin the evangelistic work right here at Sidewell Road or wherever it is you attend. Now tonight, if you are not a member of this congregation, would you raise your hand? If you're not a member of this congregation, we're going to pass out to you some folders. This is information about the School of Evangelism. You can take it to your local church. Um, this will uh, allow you the opportunity to talk to your elders. Maybe you are an elder. About uh, Just raise your hand again. Jared is passing these out. And we would be glad to bring the School of Evangelism to your local congregation. And uh, we hope that you will um, just uh, right over here on the other side there, Jared. And if there, there are any others, any others that are not from this congregation. All right. Very good. Turning your congregation into a personal evangelism machine. Or we might say, turning your congregation into an evangelistic body. It was Winston Churchill who said, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. I believe one of the biggest challenges we have in local churches is we have no plan. Brother, we are literally shooting from the hip. When it comes to every other activity, we have a plan. Don't worry. I mean, when it comes to your 2022 calendar, man, you've got it filled out, gentlemen. We know exactly what we're going to do. Let me, let, me help, um, let me help you fill that out for 2022. For most churches of Christ, this is what it looks like. In the month of January, we're going to, we're going to start pew packers. We're going to get all the children. We're going to start teaching them Bible facts. We're going to teach them the 66 books of the Bible, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 apostles. We're going, probably going to start a daily Bible reading program, right? We're going to read our Bibles through, all those who bring their Bibles. We're going to start that in January. Now, in February, we're going to do some type of sweetheart dinner, marriage retreat. We're going to have some special lessons on, on um, courtship. We're going, to, we're going to emphasize love. It's after all, it's, it's, it's Valentine's Day. Now, in March, it's spring gospel meeting. We're going to print up our gospel meeting flyers. We're going to we're going to mail them all over the city. We're going to invite all the sister churches. After all, the success of a gospel meeting is how many sister churches attend. And then in April, we're going to do the Easter egg hunt. No, we don't call it that. We call it the spring party. We're going to do the spring party. We're going to have the money egg. We're going to get the, all the ladies are going to go and take you to J.C. Penney. You're going to get the new tie. They're going to get the new dress. We're going to all come. And uh, it's, it's, it's April. Then it's May. Well, May, well, that's graduation banquet. I mean, you've got to graduate, everybody. We're going to have to set up the fellowship hall. We're going to have the various school colors on different uh, tables. We're going to have the money tree. The cards are going to be sent. The PowerPoint's going to be prepared. Johnny's picture is going to be in the bulletin. We're going to have some special uh, a get together, finger food, sandwiches. We're going to congratulate the graduate. Then there's June. It's VBS time. It's time to get that. We got to do vacation Bible school. Time to knock some doors. Time to get transform the church. I mean, we're going to build Noah's Ark or something in the auditorium. We're going to invite all the neighborhood children. Now, July, Bible camp, summer series, youth series. We're going to go all out. It's a busy summer. We are going to be involved, and we're going to go all in. And uh, there is no time to rest. Church in August, Teacher's Appreciation Day, time for back-to-school backpacks. And we're going to pack them all in, and we're going to make sure everybody has something to go back to school with. We're going to bring in a special speaker, make sure the children understand it's important to be godly while you're at school. In September, fall gospel meeting. It's time to bring in the big speaker. We're going to invite all the sister churches. Make sure we count them. And then we're going to go to October. One man is trick or trunk. We're going to line up all the members' trunks out here. We're going to invite the community. We're going to pass out candy. It's going to be wonderful. And then in November, well, man, it's turkey time, benevolent time, meals on wheels. It's time to do. It's time to give out food to the poor and make sure people are taken care of in the winter months. In December, it's the dreaded men's meeting. We don't like it, but we have to have it. And we're going to have the holiday party. We might even exchange some gifts, put some cards out there. That's the typical calendar for the Church of Christ. Brethren, we have been doing that for 20 and 30 years. How many souls are being saved? How many people are coming to the Lord? 
What I want to do in this session is help turn the congregation into an evangelistic body. I'm not against the graduation banquet, but brethren, it better be evangelistic. I'm not against vacation Bible school, but it better be something that wins souls. Everything you do at the local church needs to be focused on winning souls. So I'm going to give you a plan. If you'll take your evangelism simplified guidebook and turn to the very back, you're going to see the 10 point plan. I'm going to go over it point by point. Brethren, these are the 10 things we teach in our school that every church of Christ needs to do in order to begin the process of changing the culture. You've got to create an evangelistic culture in your church. Number one, you have got to purchase evangelism tools. Most churches have napkins, forks, spoons, knives, tablecloths, tables, coffee pots, coffee cups, coffee filters, coffee creamers, coffee sugar. We got ovens, we got microwaves, we got refrigerators, we got teacher supply rooms, glue scissors, laminating machines, cutting boards, you name it, we've got it, but we don't have evangelism materials. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Most churches of Christ do not have the materials to do the job. When I walked into the Sidewell Road Church, I was, I was surprised because you had some evangelism materials. Most churches don't. In fact, most churches, uh, if you ask somebody, I've got to do a Bible study, they'd have to call the gospel advocate because we don't have it. The number one thing you can do if you want to be successful is supply the church with the materials to do the job. They need Bibles. They need back to the Bible. They need open Bible. They need does it matter, but leave the Bible. Jewel Miller, whatever it is you're going to use, fishing for men, I don't care. But we have got to provide the members with the tools to do the job. They need workbooks to train them. They need books to, 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 to focus on specialty items. We need tracks, door hangers, DVD. These USB drives, anything you can think of, we've got to have it. Brethren, if you owned a business and you didn't provide your employees the tools in order to successfully navigate through um, their job, it's never going to get done. We have got to provide the members the tools. Number two, if you can have all the tools in the world, but if you do not place them out where people can get them, they're worthless. I walked into a church last year or two years ago, and um, I said, brother, do you have any evangelism tools? He said, oh, yes, preacher. We knew you were coming. He said, follow me. Well, we followed him down the hallway. And as we were walking down the hallway, he got out the ring of keys. Have you men ever seen the ring of keys? He pulled the ring of keys out. He said, now this door's locked. He said, but we'll find the key. We went through key one, key two, key three, key four. Finally, we found the key. We opened the door. We walked into the, to the, the room. He said, now they're in here somewhere. Oh, there they are. They're in the locker. We went back to the locker. Oh, it's locked. Don't worry, ring of keys. We brought out the ring of keys, went through key one, key two. We finally opened the locker. He pulled out from the top shelf a package of back to the Bible. He said, see, preachers, we were prepared. We had everything we needed. I said, brother, I want to know why the evangelism materials are locked in a locker and locked in a room at the end of the hallway. He said, oh, well, preacher, that's easy. He said, we were afraid someone might get them. Someone might get them. I said, brother, is it that the point? He said, oh, oh. he said, well, did I say that? I said, yes, sir. He said, brethren, if you're going to have evangelism materials, I want to know why they're locked in a locker. I want to know why they're in a library that no one uses. I want to know why they're in the preacher's office. I want to know why they're in a filing cabinet buried in row three. Put them out there where people can get them. I went to one church and I said, uh, preacher, I said, um, I said, I know we just did the seminar. I said, where is your evangelism material? He said, oh. He said, yeah, about that. He says, uh, well, Rob, I, I put them out there like you, you taught us. And I said, well, good. He said, now, Rob, um, he said, after I put them out there, I came back a couple of days later and they were all gone. I said, well, that's wonderful. The members were taking them. He said, oh, no, Rob. He said, um, he said, no, I, 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 I set the table up again. I had more materials. So I put them out there again. A few days later, they were all gone. And I said, brother, what's going on? He said, well, I was going to find out. He said, I called one of the elders. I said, brother, I said, where are our evangelism materials? He says, now, preacher, when we built this $3 million facility, remember that we took suggestions as to what goes in the foyer. He says, and that was never in the approved items. He said, now, Remember, we were supposed to get these things approved. So we decided as not to upset the ladies. He said, we decided we put it, we need to put it in the coat closet. 
One of the ladies came out yesterday and they complained about these items. They said it did not match the decor. And he said, so we have put these items in the coat closet and you can just announce if anyone wants these materials, they can go into the coat closet. He said, so Rob, he says, uh, I got into the pulpit and I preached about the evangelism materials in the coat closet. I told the brethren all about it. I said, brethren, go to the coat closet, grab back to the Bible, grab evangelism materials. Get does it matter? Believe the Bible. He said, when I was done with my sermon, I walked out there. I stood by the coat closet. I opened the door. And do you know how many people walked in the door of the coat closet to get the evangelism materials? Yes. None. May I suggest tonight that if we cannot put evangelism materials in the foyers of our church buildings, we sell the building and go home. Brethren, the purpose of the church is to seek and save the lost. If we can't do that in the church of Christ because it doesn't match the decor, then we're not the church of Christ. Number three. Oh, by the way, here's some pictures of what it looks like. Uh, you can get uh, tablecloths. They can... They can Table covers, it can say Sidewell Road Church of Christ. You put out your back to the Bible. You put out your does it matters. You put out the, uh, the DVDs. You put out the contact cards. You put out the bookmarks. You put out the door hangers. And you make sure that everybody can see it. Number three, you train the church how to use them. Who runs a business and buys tools and buys equipment, but doesn't train their workers how to use the equipment? What good is a DWAT drill in the hand of a preacher? Not, not good, because I have no idea what I'm doing with it. But if I put it in your hand, it might actually build something nice. You got to train a person how to use the DWAT drill. You got to train them how to use the, 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 the uh, reciprocating saw. We need to train our church members how to use back to the Bible. I would strongly suggest that you hand out back to the Bible to every member of your church and on Sunday morning, preach back to the Bible. If you can't preach back to the Bible from the pulpit, you shouldn't be preaching. Dear friends, you should pass it out. I'll give you the PowerPoints. I will give them to you. You don't even have to work on them. I will email the PowerPoints directly to your computer. Get up there and spend four, five, six, seven, eight weeks and train your church members how to do it. Why aren't we training our members how to do Bible studies? Do you think they're going to grab back to the Bible off the shelf because you bought it? No, they're scared to death of it. I remember, Gary, the first time I went to Jacksonville, and I, the elders, uh, they said, Rob, we'd like you to come to the meetings, and we would like you to help us become more evangelistic. I said, brethren, do you have any evangelism materials? No. I said, well, we need to get some. So we got all the materials. I said, now, I said, let's put them out there on the table. He said, where would you suggest? I said, right out front. I said, they ought to have to trip over it to get into the auditorium. So we put it right out front, and I watched. This was one sister. I'll never forget it. This is the table. She walks in. She goes, oh, oh, no. She went around it because it was scary. I'm going to have to do a Bible study. She had no idea what that was, and she wasn't about to pick it up. Brethren, those materials will sit on your table until you train the church members what to do with them. Pass them out. Have your preacher walk them through it. Have them fill it out, underline the passage, circle the answers. Don't you do this at work? How many of us go to work and are untrained? Before they put you in the forklift, you get certified. Before they give you the, before they give you the, the computer and the, the $10,000 program, they train you. Train your church members, number four. Promote an evangelistic atmosphere. Make evangelism the centerpiece of your church. Permeate through everything you do. Make your congregation an evangelistic um, um, body. Use something like benevolence. I'm going to start with benevolence. I, I can't think of a greater tool to use in evangelism besides the Bible than benevolence. Now, as I was growing up, I can remember the older preachers. Brethren, I'm careful before I, I'm very careful before I disagree with some of my older brethren. I love the older preachers. My favorite preachers, Andrew Conley. I, li I listen to him almost weekly. <laughs> I love the old preachers. I, I love to listen to Roy Deaver. I love to listen to the prince of preachers. I love to, I love to listen to them cite those scriptures. But I remember hearing this lesson there are three works of the church. Do you remember this lesson? Benevolence, edification, and evangelism. Do you remember it? Because you've heard it before. There are three works of the church, right? Only three works. 
I believe there's one word. I believe there's one. Brethren, we are benevolent to evangelize. We edify to evangelize. You take benevolence and separate it out from evangelism, and do you know what you got? A glorified soup kitchen. The church of Christ is not a soup kitchen. Our job is not to cure world poverty. Our job is not to feed every poor member in the Jackson City of Mississippi. We can't do it. Our job is to take benevolence, tie it to evangelism, and save souls. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. Benevolence is one of the best evangelistic tools you've got. It creates an atmosphere in the community that this church cares. I'm going to give you one quick way to do it. I've got a bunch of these, but I'm going to give you one quick one. Hello? Is this the Church of Christ? Yes, sir. My name's Rob Whitaker. Do you pay light bills? Yes, sir. Do you pay mortgages? Yes, sir. Do you pay car payments? Yes, sir. Do you pay for food? Yes, sir. Whatever they say, we do it. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter to me what they ask. It's always yes. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Uh, you, you pay light bills? Oh, yes, sir. You pay gas bills? Yes, sir. We pay gas bills, too. W when do you do this? Every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We can't wait to see you. When? Wednesday night at 7. I don't know if I can get there. I'm so sorry. But there are some city services that might be able to help you. Now, what time again do I need to come? 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, I got three children. Bring them all. We can't wait to meet them. Are you sure? Absolutely. 7 o'clock on Wednesday, don't forget. I'll be there. And when they walk into these doors and they say, Hi, my name's Tim. I'm here because y'all said you'd help me. Oh, yes, sir. Tim, I tell you what, this good man right here, he's one of our deacons. He's going to take you to room number two. Take him to room number two. Get out back to the Bible and do a Bible study. Why can't we do that? We should be doing that to every person who asks for help. You take a note and say, now, sir, before we, we talk about your light bill, we need to talk about your soul. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. We do that at Jacksonville. When we have a benevolent request, we say, oh, yes, sir, we pay mortgages. Be glad to help you. Yes, sir. Come, come every Sunday morning at 930. That's when we pay them. Brethren, that is a simple answer. It's easy. Every church can do it. You know, for most churches, benevolence is an albatross around the neck. You don't like it. I didn't like it so much at Willette that I got a different phone line, and I put an answering service on it because I didn't want to answer it anymore. I was missing out on Bible studies. Shouldn't have done that. That's just one thing you can do. It works very effectively. Now, don't miss worship. But, brethren, if you can't do a Bible study during Bible class, maybe you shouldn't have Bible class. I can't think of a better thing to do during Bible class than do a Bible study. So you should have trained people in this church who are ready at a moment's notice to do a Bible study. And when they walk in the door and say, I'm here because I need help. Room number two is wide open. Go do your study. And after the study is open, over, do you know what you do? Oh, yes, the elders would like to see you now. And then the elders, you, you can sit down. Sit down with them, James. Now, what is it that you need? I need you to help me with my mortgage now. Well, how much do you need, sir? Now, we, we can't help with that much, but we'll help a little bit. Wouldn't it be nice to help somebody that actually did a Bible study than some charlatan that's run out of gas, and they always run out of gas in your parking lot, and they're always going to New York, and they have some reverend you've never heard of before. Are you a member of the Church of Christ? Oh, yes, I've been a, my reverend is so-and-so-and-so, and, so and, so, and you know they're ripping you off. I don't do that anymore. When they run out of gas in my parking lot, I say, I'm sorry, but we'd be glad to fill it up Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. That's just one thing you can do. But there's a lot of benevolence that can be done. But the question is, are you doing Bible studies? See, I'm glad you're giving away turkeys. God bless you for the turkey. Thank you for having meals on wheels. Thank you for having a benevolent building. I'm glad you're doing the winter coat drive. I, do, I guess you don't do those in Mississippi. I'm glad you have the bread, the bread pantry, the bread box. I'm glad you do vouchers. I'm all for all of this, but I want to know where your Bible studies are. Brethren, if you separate benevolence from evangelism, you are no longer doing the work of the church. So I'm suggesting that maybe there's just one word. And evangelism is the way we use benevolence and edification to save souls. Her name is Kim. Kim called the church and said, I got this house to house, heart to heart. Yes, ma'am. It says you offer free benevolence. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
Can you help me? Yes, ma'am. Um, Kim, we'll be by your house. Do you have a cart? No. We'll be by your house to pick you up uh, Sunday morning. Well, that's really nice. Be glad to. We picked her up, brought her to church, got to know her just a little bit, took her home. I said, Kim, is everything okay at the house? Well, not really. Um, I'm out of food. I said, well, Kim, we're never going to let a person go hungry, would you? I wouldn't, ever. Someone needs food, we're going to make sure they have it. I said, Kim, let's go to the store. She said, you take me to get food? I said, absolutely. I said, let's go to the store. We went to the store. I said, what do you need? Well, she picked up a few items, and uh, then we went back to the house, and uh, we helped her put them away. I said, Kim, by the way, would you like to come to church tonight? What are the odds? And she says, no. She said, oh, I'd love to come back. I said, great, we'll pick you up. Six o'clock, we picked her up. We did that for several weeks. Members of the church were helping. I don't do all this by myself. I've just, uh, in fact, I'm gone most of the time. When I got back in town, I said, how's Kim? We're taking her to church, Rob. I said, great. Hey, um, hey Kim, um, would you like to know more about the church? Oh, yes. I said, I just so happen to have these booklets. I said, why don't we sit down and talk about the church? She said, all right. So we sat down and we started our Bible study. And uh, we passed out book number one, the green booklet. And, and, um, and so we, we did our Bible study together. And uh, I noticed that Kim was having a hard time reading. She couldn't read. Hey, Kim, can you not see the words? Nah. Rob, I need glasses. I broke mine. I can't afford to get a new pair I said, well, did you check on the replacement cost? She said, yeah, uh, $149 for two pairs. I said, not too bad. I said, where's that at? Uh, Glasses USA down the road. I said, yeah, I know it. Um, Kim, make your appointment. But Rob, I can't afford it. I didn't ask that. I said, make your appointment. I said, we'll do the Bible study later. And so we made her appointment. Nicole took her down. We got her two glasses. What do you think she did when we finished that Bible study? She's my sister today. This is the most important point I'm going to make in this entire lesson. This right here. I want you to put a peg right here. If you don't do this, you have nothing. Brethren, you must develop a contact list. You've got to, you've got to, you, if you don't have a contact list, you have nothing at all when it comes to evangelism. So I want to help you develop a contact list. We're going to go down through a few of these items together. Number one, the best thing to do to produce a contact list is use house to house, heart to heart. Well, then it is, it, is a, it is a contact list that never stops producing. This is something that we can do in your community to promote this church. And if you'll come talk to me, I'll help you set it up where it produces Bible studies. We will, we will help you set it up where you offer the things that people are going to respond to. Like, for example, um, we offer free transportation. We offer benevolent help. We offer uh, Bible classes for all ages. Uh, we offer Bible camps. Uh, we offer, a, we, have a, we have a youth, uh, you have a youth uh, ministry here. Uh, make sure that you put a phone number on there that people can actually reach a human being. Make sure that you put a, an email address that actually works. I went to one congregation a month ago, and I decided I'd be a visitor. I took their house to house. And you know what I did? I called the number. It was disconnected. Then I sent an email. Bounced back. Then I went to their Facebook page. Didn't work. Rob, this house to house isn't working too well. No, I doubt it. No, of course it's not working well. None of the information on there gets me to a human being. And so if you're going to use a tool like this, at least put pertinent information on it. And this is what might happen. I got back from a seminar, and uh, I looked over to my left, and there was this family, uh, this, this lady sitting in the pew. And I walked up to Alan. He'd just finished preaching. I said, Alan, who is that? Rob, uh, she came uh, uh, this morning while you weren't here, and uh, or she came last week, Wednesday night, and uh, her name's Ellen. And I got some information on her. I said, well, great. I said, uh, I said, was she alone? She said she was, but she's, she lives just down the road. I said, absolutely. So I, I strategically placed myself on the right-hand side so she'd run into me. So the amen was said. She comes out. There I am. Hey, uh, ma'am, uh, are you visiting this? Oh, my name's Rob. Oh, she says, I'm Ellen. I said, Ellen, do you live here? Yes. I said, well, glad to have you this morning. I said, I wish my wife was here this morning. She, she's visiting her mom, worshiping with her, and um, I'd love her to meet you. I said, are, are you by yourself? She said, well, no, my husband, but he was sick this morning. And I said, oh, Ellen? I said, I, said, uh, I sure would like to meet your husband, and my wife will be back this evening. She said, well, do you have an evening service? I said, sure, 6 o'clock. Glad we weren't shut down. She said, um, she said uh, I think I'll bring him back. I think I'll bring my husband tonight. 
And I said, good. I said, I can't wait to meet him. His name's Perry. And so we came back that night, and Ellen and Perry were sitting over there. Nicole and I walked over, and I said, uh, Ellen, this is my wife, Nicole. She said, well, this is my husband, Perry. We just started talking. And uh, I said, hey, guys, we have to have this custom. We take people out to eat. I treat. Where would you like to go eat? I'd like to get to know you. She said, Perry said, well, there's an Italian restaurant, but it's a little expensive. It's my favorite. I said, sounds good, Perry. He says, man. He said, my stomach's a little queasy. He said, can I do it next Sunday with you guys? I said, yes, absolutely. I'll make reservations. And I did. They came Sunday morning. And, uh, and uh, after services, we, we went down to Athena's, a little restaurant there in Jacksonville. We sat at the table. And I don't care anything about the lasagna. I want a Bible study, and I'm going to get it. So I'm probing. I said, hey, Perry, what do you think about... Uh, what do, you, what do you think about uh, football, Perry? I don't watch that anymore. Me neither. I said, what, what do you think about baseball? I'm not interested. And, and, and Perry, well, well, what do you think about basketball? Well, I like, well, I like college football. I said, me too. Me too. I said, Perry, what team do you like? He says, I love Alabama. Me too. I love them. I love them. They're the greatest team around. It's wonderful. And... Um, and um, and um, he, I, he, said, he, said, he said, I said, go Nick Saban. And he said, yes. And Nick, he, said, he said, Rob, it's been a terrible year. I said, yes, every year Alabama doesn't win the championship is a terrible year. And, I, and he, said, he said, Rob, you know, Alabama should be in that game tomorrow. It was LSU and Clemson. You remember, right? And I said, Perry, do you like to watch football? All I want is a Bible study and I will get it. Oh, he says, I love to watch football. I said, Perry, when we bought our house, the people who owned it first, they put in a movie room, has 11 speakers. You have never seen football until you've seen it on this huge screen. Perry, I think, Nicole, do you know what, ow, what was that? That was Nicole kicking me in the shin. She knows what I'm going to do. I think tomorrow you should fix a feast, honey. We need to have beanies and weenies, and we need to wrap them around, you know, in the croissant rolls, mustard on them. We need to have dips and chips, honey. I said, bring it out. Perry and Ellen, why didn't you come over for a football party? All I want is a Bible study. I will get it. Brethren, everything I do when I meet a sinner is geared to get a Bible study. Everything. Let me tell you this. If Perry and Ellen are going to go to hell, they're going to go to hell with me holding on to their ankles. Don't let your friends go to hell without you holding on. If they're going to go, let them go kicking and screaming, but you're holding on. Do everything within your power to do a Bible study. Make it your mission. How many of you have a mission, Ben? You like to hunt? Fish? You like to work on cars? You have a mission? I bet you, I bet you hit it. Men, when they have a mission, they hit it. You got the big buck, the big bass, the boat, the ATV. What's your mission? I bet you hit it. We always hit our missions, don't we? My mission is a Bible study. You can hit it, gentlemen. Make it your mission. They came over to the house that night, and we're watching the football game. Lord, make it a blowout. Lord, make it a blowout. And it was by the halftime. I mean, LSU was blowing them away. I said, Perry, this game's not important. Turn it down, honey. And Perry, I got a question for you. You know, there are a lot of churches in Jacksonville. I don't understand why you came to the Jacksonville Church of Christ. You know, I'm just curious. Why'd you come? Well, 20 years ago, Rob, when we moved to Jacksonville, we started getting this little magazine called House to House, Heart to Heart, 20 years ago. And uh, our church... Uh, it's not the same church it used to be. I said, where is it? In the Methodist church. Rob, they don't believe in marriage anymore. I said, yeah, I've been reading about that. We're looking for a church that follows the Bible, and that little magazine always follows the Bible. I said, would you like to know more about this church? He said, we sure would. I just so happened to have these booklets. Honey, grab the Bibles. What do you think happened after three weeks? They never miss. What would have happened if we didn't have house to house, heart to heart? I wouldn't have baptized them. Let me go to the next one. You need to promote your events. You need to promote marriage seminars, apologetics press seminars, uh, existence of God seminars, parenting seminars. Those things bring people in. So think about when you plan your annual events, plan events that you can promote like vacation Bible school. Is there an event all year long that brings in more sinners than vacation Bible school? Is there? I mean, we're full of them. You need to promote things that bring the sinners. And you need to make sure 
that you answer the special requests that people make. Oh, I got to Jacksonville. I've been there six months. And, I, and, and Deborah Rice, one of the I love Deborah. She calls me. She said, hey, Rob. She said, we got this request for some marriage material. Now, I know you're trying to help us with this evangelism stuff. She says, now, this lady, her name is Brenda. She has requested marriage material. I said, what do you normally do with that request? She says, oh, we mail it. I said, don't do it. She says, well, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to hand deliver it. I said, put it in my box, please. She put it in the box. Nicole and I ran down to the office. We grabbed out the, grabbed out the material. We, uh, we, we set out as a mission, find Brenda. It took us several days to find Brenda. The address was difficult to read. I finally found it. I uh, knocked on the door. Brenda opened the door. I make sure they see Nicole before me because I'm scary. They bring, opened it up. She smiles at Nicole. Then she looks at me and takes a step back. I said, ma'am, my name is Rob. This is my sweet wife, Nicole. We're from house to house. You requested some marriage material. Oh, yeah. She said, so sweet. I said, have you just moved to Jacksonville? Oh, yes, yes, sir. I, I just moved to Jacksonville. Have you just got married? Oh, yes, I just got married uh, uh, last month. I said, well, congratulations, Brenda. Yes, yes. And, and, uh, and sir, she said, why did you not mail this material to me? I said, well, then I couldn't have met you. And I wanted to meet you. Oh, well, that was real sweet. I said, well, Brenda, what do you think about this area out here? Wow, I really like it. And she said, sir, she said, can I ask you a, a question? I said, yes. She says, do you know anything about the Bible? I said, oh, just a little bit. And she says, good, because my husband knows nothing about the Bible. Daniel, get off the couch. That man has been on the couch ever since he came home from work. I don't know what he's doing over there. Daniel, get up over here. We've got guests. Daniel gets up. He, he, he you know, clears off his eyes, and he's coming to the door. And, and this is my husband, Daniel. They're here to teach you the Bible. This man doesn't know anything about the Bible. I said, when would you like to begin? She says, right now. I said, well, well, I'll tell you what, uh, Daniel, uh, you look like you've worked all day long. He says, I'm exhausted. I said, why don't we do this tomorrow? My wife will make you a nice dinner. And I said, I said really? I said, absolutely. I said, and we'll, uh, we'll do this Bible study together. She said, well, I like that. I like to eat. Always eat. It's never wrong to eat. And uh, we baptized Daniel, Brenda. Then we baptized Brother, cousin, and then there was Geneva. You remember Geneva, don't you? With four children. What would have happened if we mailed that request? Nothing. If you want to have an effective evangelistic work, you've got to go to the people. You need to create a target list. One of the things that we do at House to House is we allow you to create your own target list. So not only can you... Select an area to send house to house. What we do is we pass out the clipboard and say, do you have any neighbors that you would like to have house to house sent to? Just give us their addresses. In fact, we will mail it outside of your mailing area. So everybody, you can give us 10 addresses. You can give us 20. We're going to mail it to everybody. I want to mail house to house to every friend you've got, every family member you've got in Jackson, Mississippi. I want to mail it all to them. And this is what you're going to do. James, what happens if you did this? You put all your friends on the mailing list because they don't live all in that selected neighborhood where you're mailing it. So you have put your friends you work with on the mailing list. And let's just suppose after six months, you came up to one of your friends and said, hey, hey, Bob, um, I've got this magazine right here. Have you been getting this at your house? Yeah, I've been wondering where that came from. I subscribe to it for you. I know we have these religious discussions. I thought you might like it. What do you think of House to House, Heart to Heart? Are there any articles that you enjoy reading? In fact, would you give me a suggestion on an article? What subject matter do you like to study in the Bible? You need to knock doors. We need to knock doors. You've got to go to the people. There are some people out there, brethren, you're not going to, they're not coming to you. They're, they're not going to, you don't know them. They're not connected to you. The only way you find them is to knock doors. I would suggest maybe on October the 2nd, Go door knocking. Why would I say October the 2nd? Because that's the national door knocking day for the churches of Christ. We have tried. We tried this in 2019. We had 700 churches go door knocking, and we baptized, I don't know how many people, but there were lots of baptisms on the very day we door knocked. There were people we found that people were talking to and having Bible studies with. Does it matter? For example, the one study method. This year, we want 1,000 churches. I hope you'll be a part of that. Why don't you go to house2house.com, register your congregation, go door knocking. Door knocking is very effective. When you do it, 
I'm not suggesting you're going to convert 100 people, but you'll find one. That's all you're looking for. You just need to find one. If you go to enough houses, you'll find it. You're going to find that person that says this, um, yeah, I used to go to the Church of Christ. My name's Gary. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, I went about 30 years ago. Uh, yes, but my wife left me, got run over by a paver. Run over by a paver. Yes, sir, on disability. Haven't been to church in 30 years. Um, what, what church are you from, sir? I, I'm from the Church of Christ. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Gary, can we talk about the Church of Christ? Yeah, no one comes to visit me for some reason. I said, I'd love to visit with you. That's the kind of person you find. By the way, he's a faithful Christian today. See, if you don't go door knocking, you don't find those people. By the way, Jonathan Royal, you don't find him if you don't door knock. Johnny Royal, who's preaching right now, don't find him if you don't door knock. Charles Hunt, you don't find him if you don't door knock. You see, all those, all those families I started this seminar with, we did all those door knocking. I'm not telling you you're going to convert the entire community, but you're going to find a few. What about the new movers? What if I could give you the address and the name of every person who moved into your community? What, what, if, what if we could provide you the location with an app and show you where they live? How about if I could tell you, hey, James, or, or, or hey, Gary, or, or whoever he is, or Derek, what if I could say this, Derek, you've got two neighbors that have moved into your local subdivision, and I can give you their name and address, and you could go deliver a new mover basket. You say, preacher, what's a new mover basket? Go ask your ladies. My wife is teaching them how to go shopping in the name of the Lord right now. Go to the Dollar Tree, get 10 items. They're all a dollar. It's okay. Go deliver it. Say, welcome to the community. My name is Derek. My wife is Hannah. And uh, we'd like to provide you this, this nice gift from the church. And, um, and uh, what, 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 if you, uh, what if we added this? What if we sent them a copy of House to House? What if we sent them a postcard two weeks later? And we do all of that. Uh, by the way, gentlemen, those of you who like budgets, I like budgets. Listen to this. How about if I told you it cost $5? Would you like that? Five dollars. Can all of us afford five dollars? That's how much this costs. It costs five dollars to get that information. Then it costs us one dollar to print and mail the material. And we just pass it on. So this is the kind of stuff right here that produces contact. You've got to have contacts. David Shannon said people are most likely to change churches when they move. A couple of generations ago, if a couple or a family or an individual moved from one city to another city, they usually stayed with that same denomination. Those days are over. It doesn't matter to me what denomination they were a part of in the last town. I want them to visit the Church of Christ because that gives us the best opportunity to sit down with them and study the Word of God. Then we're going to produce a strategic compassion card ministry. We are going to overwhelm them with cards. I'm not going to go buy day spring cars from the local denomination. Brethren, we have designed cars for members of the Church of Christ, and they are strategically laid out for you to win souls. Can you imagine? This is actually Jacksonville. This is our card group one. We have four, three groups. This is group one, and they're meeting, and they're sending the cards. Let's imagine we take a contact, and we overwhelm them with cards. Let's say we take one of those new movers that you gave a basket to, Let's say we put their name on it, and we start overwhelming them with cards. I'm not talking about one card with 20 signatures. I'm talking about 30 cards. And they go out to their mailbox, and they got 30 cards week one, 30 cards week two, 30 cards week three. When Gary goes and knocks on their door and says, My name is Gary Hampton. I'm from the Sidewell Road Church of Christ. We've been sending you cards. What are the odds that he gets a good reception? Pretty high. Now, let's just say, Gary, you arbitrarily just go out there and knock on somebody's door and say, hi, my name's Gary Hampton. I'm here to visit you. Who? Gary Hampton. I'm not interested. I'm not here to sell it. Don't matter. I'm not interested. You send them 100 cards, I guarantee they're interested. You show them compassion, I promise you. You're not going to, it's going to be rare that you get a grouch. It's going to be pretty common that you're going to get someone like Bettina. Just like Bettina. See all those cards she's holding? When I walked into her house after the Jacksonville Church of Christ had done their job, because I can't do this without you. The preacher cannot do this without your help. 
because the church did their job. I walked into a house full of cards, and I looked at Bettina, and I said, Bettina, would you like to know more about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? She said, I sure would. Never had a church love me like this before. I just so happened to have these booklets. I said, Bettina, let's do book one. That's, see that green booklet? She just finished it. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. We're in the third book, and we're going through it together. And uh, we come to Mark 16, 16. I've never had this happen before. It will probably never happen again. Bettina, would you read Mark 16? Now, Bettina knows her Bible, and she's doing really well with the studies. And I can tell she has a religious background. I even think maybe in the Church of Christ, but I'm not sure, just some of the words she's used. Oh, yeah, Rob, I know Mark 16, 16. My pastor told me all about it. I said, really? I said, well, what did this pastor say? Well, uh, he that believes is saved and baptized. Uh, Bettina, would you read Mark 16, 16 for me? Yes, he that believes is saved and then baptized. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Rob, is there something wrong with what I'm doing? I said, well, King James. Uh, Bettina, would you read it like one word at a time? Re read just like one word at a time. Okay, okay. He that believes and is baptized shall be. He that believes and is. That is not what my pastor told me that verse said. I said, God. She said, I'd never, I've never read that verse like that before. I said, well, what, what must you do? Believe and baptize. What do you think she did? I had a sneaky suspicion she knew something about the Church of Christ just during the study, so I had to ask. We went out to eat, of course, always eat. And I said, Bettina, I said, um, um, do you know any, did you ever visited a Church of Christ before? Oh, yes, Rob. She said, now, I was a Baptist. Not anymore. Thank God. I said, but now, Rob, she says, in my last town. She said, let me tell you what I did. She said, she said I, could, I didn't have a car. And there was this Ohatchee church right next door. She said, so it was the Church of Christ, and I could walk to it. So I just walked to the Church of Christ every day. I said, well, wonderful. I said, you probably didn't go very often, did you? Oh, every Sunday. Uh, you probably didn't do this for very long. Seven years. Uh, Bettina, you were there seven years, and during that seven-year period of time, did anybody, say, offer you a Bible study? No, never done one. So you said, oh, they were a nice church, though, Rob, very benevolent. But no one ever asked for a Bible study? No. First time I've ever done a Bible study was with y'all. Seven years? So we have people that have been sitting in our pews for seven years and no one's done a Bible study with them? No wonder we're declining. Just a few months later, six, about six months later, I got a phone call from uh, Rebecca. We were out of town. And, hey, Rob, where are you at? I said, Rebecca, we're in Texas. And she said, oh, hey, Rob, uh, there's something wrong with Bettina. I said, well, what's wrong with Bettina? Rob, she's, she's blue. I said, what do you mean? Well, shake her. He said, Rob, I have. Rob, she won't wake up. She said, I had to call 911. Rather than she didn't make it. Aren't you glad she still wasn't going to Ohatchee? We need to have a, we need to have a ministry that targets visitors. Targets visitors. So therefore, when a visitor walks in the door... We identify them. We have people strategically. We're going to say, your job is to target visitors. You and your wife, you have one job at this church. What is it? Target visitors. So every time a visitor walks in, your job is to sit down in the pew with the visitor. Do not assault them at the door. Sit down. And when you sit down, you say something like this. My name's Rob. What's your name? And I'm going to sit next to you. And you're going to say your name is? Sam. 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 Uh, and uh, Sam, are you visiting from the local community? All right, nice to meet you. I said, hey, I've got something for you, Sam. You're going to go grab your visitor bag. You're going to give it to Sam and his lovely wife and children. 
and you're going to say, hey, by the way, Sam, the church over here, we like to send cards that thank you for coming. How do you spell your first name, S-A-N? What's your last name? And what's your address? He will, I will never allow a visitor to leave the local church ever again without getting their contact information. I'm going to tell you something that happened. I, I told the deacons I was going to finish this story, some of the elders. I was, uh, I was at Jacksonville just uh, not long ago, and, and I'd, I'd been a couple, two or three weeks since I'd been there. And uh, it was like a, I think it was a Sunday night we'd gotten in, and I was sitting down, I noticed this couple on the back of the pews, and, and I said, hey, brother, who, who is that back there? Oh, they've been visiting. Wonderful. What are their names? I don't know. Um, do we have contact cards? I don't think so. How long have they visited? Oh, a couple weeks. Oh, certainly someone knows, because um, we've trained the church, right? Um, brother, who, who is that back there? Been visiting, yes, several weeks. Who are they? Don't know. Um, this is one of the elders. Have we got a contact card? Oh, yes. Where are the visitor bags? Have you passed one out? No. At this point, my blood pressure is enough to put me into a coronary. I walked up to those two young people, and uh, they were in their, I'd say, late 20s. And I said, hey, my name is Rob. What's your name? Name's Dre. And what's your name? Oh, my name's Teresa. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, well, well we just moved here. I said, wonderful. I said, uh, um, has anybody given you the gift? Gift? I said, oh, yes. I said, let me get the gift. So I brought the gift over. Well, that's really nice. We have all sorts of gift items in there. That's where, hey, hey, guys, uh, do you mind if I get an address so we can send you some cards? Oh, yes, we'd love to get No form letters. I don't want any form letters. All handwritten cards. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all that filled out. And um, the next day was Memorial Day. I said, hey, Dre and Teresa, you're new. I bet you don't know anybody in this town. No, we really don't. I said, I, said, I think we're going to have a Memorial Day party. We weren't, but we are now. And I said, I said, I said, Dre, what do you like to eat? He says, I like steak. I said, so do I. I said, we just happen to be grilling out steak. Teresa, what do you like? I like chicken. Oh, we're going to have chicken too. Hey, if you guys don't know anybody, why don't you come out and just spend the day with us? My, we've got a dune buggy. We've got a few acres. I said, we'll have a good time. Really? I said, sure. Monday, they came out to our house. They spent all day at the house. We, bought, we brought four other new converts out. I called every new convert and said, your mission is to help me get a Bible study. I said, I want you to talk to Dre and Teresa. Just make them feel at home. Make them feel like, make them feel like they're, they're one of ours. Just, just, just extend hospitality. We all sat there. We played games. We rode the dune buggy. We ate steak and chicken, had a good time. And, and, uh, and uh, Dre said, well, this is such a nice church. I said, Dre, I said, what kind of church do you go to? He says, I'm a Mormon. I said, oh. I said well, we're, we're shut down. Keep them shut down. I want them to shut down. I don't want them to open back up. And I said, I said, Teresa, where do you go to church? She said, well, I grew up a Catholic, but now I'm a Baptist. But Dre and I are trying to find a church. I said, would you like to know more about the Jacksonville church? We sure would. Y'all are so nice. I just so happened to have these booklets. When I get home, I will do study three. Just read your reaching the lost. Look for the picture. I baptized them two weeks ago in my head. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm very confident. Do you know why? Because I serve a winning God. I serve a victorious God. I serve a God that doesn't know how to lose. Only we know how to lose. Brethren, our God knows how to fight when we fight for him. Do you know why Israel lost in Judges? Because they stopped fighting. Just read it. you know why they won in Joshua? Because they didn't know how to lose. We have to fight. When you fight for God, you don't have to worry about it. This book will do what God intended for it to do. I've only baptized one Mormon. I pray God I can baptize another. They're hard. They're really tough. This is what visitor bags do for you. That's Lindsay and Cameron. That's March of this year. That young man right there sitting with them, that's Keith Ritchie, our new preacher. You know why he's doing a Bible study? Visitor bag. Keith doesn't know a visitor from a member. He doesn't know the difference. He's brand new. I saw Cameron and Lindsay walk in. I walked right up to them. I wasn't waiting for somebody to... I just grabbed a visitor bag. I said, hey, guys, are y'all new to the area? Sure are. I said, we got this little bag for you. I said, can I get your contact information? Yes. I walked up to Keith. I said, Keith, right there's a Bible study. Take him out to eat. He said, well, where do I go? I said, go to Athena's. I said, take him out to eat. Make sure you ask for the study. Make sure you just ask them, do you like the church? If they say yes, do the study. That's Keith on Tuesday doing the study. That's three weeks later, the baptism. 
That's this year. I keep telling you these stories because I want you to understand that I'm not here just to rattle off facts. Brethren, this stuff works. It works today. Invite people out to eat. Invite them out to eat. It's simple. Every visitor that comes to Sidewell Road should be invited out to eat. Everyone. You should never allow a visitor to walk into this building without a meal invitation. I mean, you know, whatever they... Hey, do you like steak? Go to Outback. Do you like Italian? Go wherever. I mean, let's... I mean, take them out to eat. If you take a person out to eat and de develop a relationship with them, the Bible study becomes very simple. That's another way to get contact. Use digital media. Let me, let me get hit down here to this chart. I want everybody to look at this chart. This is in your folder, by the way. That folder that was passed out, this chart right here, it's my favorite chart. Watch this. Let's suppose the church would focus their energies on people who sit in our pews. I'm going to ask Gary Hampton a question. I don't know the answer to it, Gary. Gary, is there anyone that visits Sidewell Road Church of Christ on a Sunday that sits in your pews pretty regularly and that's not a Christian? Yeah, I, I knew that, because every church has that. Let's this just is, this is, this is suppose you focused on those people. You made it a mission. It's your mission to get to them. Now, next your mission is to contact people and prospect them through compassion cards. You're going to dump a ton of cards on them. Then you're going to work on... People who just randomly visit your assembly. Remember the visitor bags? Then you're going to do some door knocking. Then you're going to use house to house, heart to heart. Then you're going to focus on new movers. Then you're going to focus on digital media and their contacts. Then you're going to work on benevolence. And guess what's going to happen if you put all the energy of the church behind this? Guess what's going to happen? That's what the average church does that's enrolled in our school. If I take it... If I, if I call these churches at the end of the year and say, how many baptisms do you have? 300% increase. Brethren, you can do this. You need to populate your sinners list. You've got to have a list. I want you to give me a list of every sinner, every person you know that's not a member of the church. I want their name. We're going to take that bookmark, and that's going to become the individual list. Then we're going to make a congregational list, and we're going to harness the power of the entire congregation on that contact. That is Mount Pleasant. Three months ago, I was there. The very first thing they did when I left was preach John 4.35. They grabbed these bookmarks. The preacher had them fill them out. We're going to list all the sinners we want to convert. They have baptized 12 people in 12 weeks. I'm going to send you instruction on how to do this. You're enrolled in the school here at Sidewell Road. This is what we're going to do. This, this right here, is, this works. It's wonderful. Number seven, get everybody participating. All these widow ladies out here, if they're sending cards to, to 20 people a week, and one of those is baptized, guess what they're going to do? They're going to walk up to Gary, and they're going to say, Gary, that baptism y'all just had, I sent them a card. And they're not going to complain about Gary forgetting to shake their hand. They're too busy celebrating about the baptism. Brethren, when you get members of the church busy in the work of the Lord, they're no longer having time to complain about what you didn't do. James did not shake my hand. I think he ignored me on purpose. No, when you're sending cards and when you're cultivating relationships and when you're baptizing people, you're too busy doing the work of the Lord than to complain about everything else. It's a wonderful thing when you get people involved. For the body is not one member but many. Make evangelism the most important work of this church. I walked into my elders meeting one time at Willette, and I said, brethren, I love you. I said, but these meetings that we've been having are, are I said, I just dread them. I said, I'm just tired of talking about the leaky roof. I'm tired of talking about the carpet. I'm tired of talking. I said, I said Can, would you let me chair the meeting? And they said, well, Rob, what do you want to talk about? Souls. And I put five names on the whiteboard. Bruce Bartley, Ronnie Rhodes, Samuel Gregory. That was the first Mormon I baptized. And then I put down the, the name of, um, of uh, Billy Hudson. I put all these names on the whiteboard. I said, brethren, what do all these names have in common? One of the elders looked at me and says, they're all lost. I said, yes. What's the other thing they have in common? They all come to church every Sunday. Yes. What's the other thing they have in common? None of them have had a Bible study. I said, my proposition is, brethren, would you help me do a Bible study with these men? They said, what are we going to do? I said, the same thing we do to everybody else. We're going to overwhelm them with love. We baptized all of them in one year. Publicize your mission from the pulpit. Do not keep it a secret. Brethren, when you 
enact an evangelism strategy, you cannot keep it from the members. And so if you're going to enact an evangelism strategy, an elder should get in front of this church and say, brethren, here's what we're going to do. We're going to change the way we do things. We're going to focus on soul winning. Support your preacher. Tell the church we're going to be a soul-saving body. And here's step number one. And we need your help. We, we need everybody to participate. Lead them. Publicize your mission. Pray for the lost. Get up there on a Sunday night and say this. This morning we had three visitors. Is there anything wrong with doing this? Turn off the internet. I've, I've actually told them that. Turn that thing off. I want to have a private meeting right here. This morning we had three visitors. I'm going to name their names. I'm going to give you their addresses. Everybody get your pen out. Write down this, these addresses. I want you to write them down. Three visitors. I said, I need your help. I need everybody. I don't care what team you're on. Go grab a card that says, um, come back soon. Thank you for visiting. Fill it out. Sign your name. Send it to them. I need your help. Publicize your mission. Harness the power of the pews. Do not place this on Gary, Derek, or Logan. They can't do it without you. Get your wives to fill a card out. And the Bible studies will come publicize it. Number 10, pray about it. We ought to be, not, that's not the, the least important thing we do. It's the most important thing we do. Brethren, if we cannot pray for lost souls in our public assemblies, then we shouldn't be praying. But I have a question for you. I'm, I'm, I really want you to think about this question. When is the last time you heard a man pray for the lost? By name. Not some general prayer. I was at Jacksonville, and I'd just gotten there. Been there about three months. And uh, Alan Webster had told me about Samuel Gregory. And so I just got up Sunday night. One of the elders said, hey, Rob, would you get the closing prayer? I said, sure. Samuel wasn't visiting on Sunday night. He only came on Sunday morning. So I prayed for him. I said, Lord, uh, I pray for a door of utterance to be opened for Samuel uh, Gregory. Lord, I, I pray that we would uh, speak words of wisdom, have my speech seasoned with salt, that I might know how to answer every man. Scriptural, you know, Ephesians 6, Colossians 4. After the prayer, I had someone come up to me, and they said, uh, Rob, uh, who is this man you are praying for? I said, he's only been sitting in your pews for two years. I said it with a little bit more love than that. But I, I'm, just, I'm just aggravated. Why were we praying for him? Because he's lost. Is it okay to pray for the lost? Should we pray for the lost? I think we should. Brethren, thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, being here. I know that uh, I know we have uh, spent a lot of time together the last three days. And uh, I think that this church is poised for greatness. You have amazing resources. You have incredible leadership. Uh, I spent the day with one of your elders, and uh, he, he loves souls. I know your preacher. He's, he's a dear friend. And um, I've got to know Derek, and uh, I'm very impressed. I've seen, the, I've seen the love that Logan and his wife have for these young people. It's great. There's a lot of good that can be done here. You just need a strategy. And uh, brethren, I, I fully believe that this church is, is just, just waiting to explode. I, don't, I want to preface one more remark and then you'll be dismissed. Not every Bible study you do, not every person you contact is going to be a conversion. I get that. Um, there are people that I, I meet and I never get the Bible study, but I never give up. It took me seven years to get to uh, Benita, seven years I told you last night I hoped I'd have good news. I can hardly talk about it. It took me 10 years to get to Bruce Bartley, but I got to him. I never give up on people. No matter what they say, how they treat me, I never give up on them. You might have 10 contacts on your contact card. Maybe you just get to one. It's all right. It's one more than you would have had. Bobby Bates used to say, my little bit of something's better than your whole lot of nothing. Brethren, we've got to get busy. Jesus said, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they're white into harvest. They're still white. God bless you, brethren. Thank you.
We just want to thank everyone for coming out for these past few days. Uh, Rob, we want to thank you personally, you and your whole family, uh, for what uh, y'all are doing. Uh, and uh, we just hope that we all can be uh, encouraged, motivated, and ready to go to work. Um, this is something that uh, I know th the fact that you're here means that uh, means a lot, that you care a lot about this, that you chose to be here t uh, tonight. And so um, do one of our elders, any of our elders have any closing comments they want to say? If, if not, uh, I'll lead us in a prayer, and we will be dismissed. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day, for this time of study, dear Lord, for this time of encouragement, for motivation, for just instruction, dear Lord, to help us to work in your kingdom. And dear Lord, just help us to take each day, dear Lord, as a new opportunity, to each soul, dear Lord, as a, as a, as a new person that we can come in contact with, that we can study with, dear Lord. Dear Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to be equipped. Dear Lord, help us to, to take the the tools and the resources we have, dear Lord, because we are so very blessed, dear Lord, and to use everything that you have blessed us with to the glory of your of you and your church. Dear Lord, just help us as a family to work together, to reach the lost, to be there for them, to help uh, maintain those uh, within the body, dear Lord, and to continue to serve you all the days of our life. For we have many that are sick and many that are hurting, dear Lord, and if it be your will, we ask them to be healed. Dear Lord, we ask you to, to be with those that are in studies this time, that the Lord, that the, that the, the teacher may teach from your word, that the teach the truth, and that the Lord, that the, the soul may be reached, the Lord, and come to the knowledge of your word. The Lord, protect us and, and guide us everywhere we go. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.